Okay, so yo, thank you so much for coming in today. Uh, my name is Noor, and I'm here on behalf of uh, Beats Union, which is an artist collective that we started in Regina, Saskatchewan, but now it's pushing to become a global thing. Um, the reason why we're doing this uh, is because we're releasing something called Music for Peace, and it's a concept to connect artists to the global peace community via the uh, uh, World Peace Councils, right? Whatever they are. And so Ed has been a great mentor for me personally, uh, kind of set me up on this path towards peace and, and learning, and um, and uh, we'll see what we can do together. So we, we do have a goal today that we want to kind of uh, come up with a fruit at the end of this conversation, and you'll be the judge whether we succeed at doing so or not. At least, at least begin some sort of a strategy, a strategy to connect people worldwide and also clarify certain things globally in terms of what it means to be a human in these days. Uh, because what we see is uh, an ideological warfare. There's all kinds of identity, all kinds of divisions. Everything is a reason to be divided today. Uh, and so we're seeking that commonality. What does it mean to be human today? I want to share with you <clears throat> just a few stories in terms of what that looked like in the past. And in certain cultures, how creating such a common human temple leads to maintaining the peace locally and also globally. We know uh, many, many individuals that have came along this world and created uh, certain philosophies about the world and were able to leave an incredible legacy and they pop up all over the world. Um, an example of that would be Confucius in, in China. Another example would be the Buddha in India. And another would be the Abrahamic religions and the people who come up with the transcendent value of sacrifice and etc. And so if we look at these things as a life philosophy, that's one angle. But there's one angle that a lot of people completely miss. And that is that there's usually a requirement. There is something in the environment that requires such philosophies to come forth. And most importantly, I don't know if you've tried to come into this world and push a certain philosophy that brings people together. It's not an easy endeavor. And so it is definitely a step up from the environment that people live in, usually. So if we look at the times of, of the Buddha in India, there used to be a, a very rigid class system that the Buddhist human temple was able to bridge society together. What happens is that people start belonging to different classes, they belong to different groups, and society goes into a stalemate that is destructive. And so to, be, to become this new type of human being or the human temple, or what I like to refer to as the um, monastic lifestyle, because humility is the path, and we'll come back to that at the end of this conversation, um, you don't have, it doesn't matter where you come from, <laughs> and it doesn't matter which class you belong to. You could be rich and join the monastic temple, you could be poor and join the monastic temple, and that's the point. And if we look in the Middle East with Judaism, with Christianity, and also with Islam, it's kind of a similar concept. And these things come at a place where unity is needed. Society has already been fragmented and self-destroying itself. And so unity becomes a necessity for continuation. And I think that's, that's a good and honorable goal for us to try to uh, aspire for. So I'll start that conversation with that kind of intro. <clears throat> and uh, Ed, my man, how you doing? I'm very well. <laughs> I'm very pleased to be here. And I congratulate Newer on this, of uh, the first release, the first musical release, and I hope that it, this first uh, discussion is very successful and will lead to many other discussions, because there, even though, you know, we may read the major daily newspapers, there's a lot of issues that we are not discussing every day. In fact, I would say there's often an effort to cloud the issues so we're not discussing what is very, very important. 
Um, uh, personally, I would see an example of that is the very little attention the, the teachers struggle in Saskatchewan has been receiving. Uh, but um, today we're not going to focus on such narrowly pa uh, uh, partisan issues. Um, we're concerned with, with major uh, peace questions. And uh, I feel very honored to be asked by Noor to come here to lead off the first discussion of peace issues. Uh, a little bit about myself. My name is Ed Lehman. If you read the Leader Post on a regular basis, you will see that I often get letters to the editor published. Um, and not always on peace questions, but I'm interested in what's going on in Regina. I think we have a mayor that's a total dud. <laughs> And uh, I think we need a change of city councillors. And I think we need a change at the provincial level as well, because I don't think the provincial government is serving our interests either. So, so Ed, and, and that's the question, is like to make such a change, we need to be able to organize and galvanize at a level that is undeniable, right? Because, I don't know, uh, you correct me if I'm wrong, but I would think that there has never been a change in history without the numbers. I th think that's uh, exactly uh, true, Nor. Um, and many times, uh, g governments had plans of doing very terrible things and pulled back. An e example right now, it seems like there might be some pulling back on the part of Israel although Israel has killed 33,000 Palestinians, and it's just uh, people being killed who have no connection to anything. Uh, okay, no, they have no connection, um, don't necessarily have a connection to anything other than being Palestinian. That's enough to get you killed or injured. So as well as the 33,000 that Israel has killed, over 70,000 have deliberately had their limbs shot off. So can you imagine uh, a kid, eight, 10 years old or younger, having one arm or one leg? This, this is, uh, and if it was anyone else but Israel, our media would be full of the stats every day, and everyone would be able to discuss what is going on. But we, most of us, have no frame of reference to look at this, these, these issues. Um, because we're really not helped by our media so, to so, understand. So, Ed, uh, I'd like I'd like to kind of bring back the conversation on a human temple a little bit, right? Because there is something that people don't realize is that we currently worldwide occupy a global type of human temple. Uh, usually, those can come also from a matter of the powers in charge and how they emerge into history and what kind of human temple they promote. Um, and, and you know, we, we hear that the entire society today is suffering from mental illness. I honestly don't know a single person who's not suffering from so-called mental illness. Uh, I suffer as well. So this room, how, how anybody else here is, is alongside this crew of, of mentally ill? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, so one, one thing that I also want to shed light on is that maybe, maybe, just maybe, that the emergence of powers in the world uh, and the switching of major powers, these are things that are bigger than me and you, they're bigger than everybody. And so when things like that are happening, um, people find their current 
temple collapsing on top of their heads and they have no idea how to maneuver and how to function anymore because only yesterday that was acceptable to be in a certain way. Uh, most importantly, it was common to be in a certain way. So specifically, I'm talking here about uh, if we can talk a little bit about the unipolar world and the emergence of it, because that's the one that we're currently living in. So we know that we had something called the Islamic Empire. We know we had something called European imperialism and colonization. And then afterwards, we had World War I. Uh, then we had World War II. And uh, then with the collapse of the Soviet Union, we had the emergence of what's so-called the unipolar world with the American empire emerging. Um, now, on, on the shallow surface, it's not supposed to be an empire because it was promoting human rights, commonality. But really, if we do a little bit of study, there is something uh, to say about the liberal identity and also the attachment to materialism. It seems that these two things are the global temples that were promoted. I know in the Middle East, Ed, a lot of people, you know, in the past, over the years, wars have been waged. And uh, what, what I mean by the, the, the promotion of the liberal identity is because it's a, it's, it's a certain human temple that calls for the detachment of traditional struggles, uh, whatever you are in the world, that the world has reached a new stage. This is the time for peace. This is the time for you to get over your issues, over your culture, over your historical problems, because now the time for peace has emerged. And can we, can we let's, let's start at the beginning of that. Uh, if you want to share, share with us your beginnings joining the peace movement and maybe also tying it into the uh, this collapse of the Soviet Union and the unipolar world as it emerged and how, how society looked looked like back then. But start with maybe why you joined the peace movement uh, leading into that, if you don't mind. When I joined the peace, I joined the peace movement a long time ago, in 1970, actually. And I've been involved in some way or other since, since that time, uh, very often in leadership capacities. And uh, I've gone to meetings across Canada to discuss peace issues over that time. Uh, I've gone around the province at times speaking. And uh, what, what happened to you personally, Ed? How, what, what switched in you? Because, you know, okay. you're doing. What switched in my mind as a teenager, I had already been one to the American Empire. And um, I have to remember that sometimes when I'm arguing and discussing with people, that people can be very genuine and, and be very wrong. And... Um, wrong be because they don't have information that they need to look at things in a more realistic way. So I was one of those people who had been taken in on the question of democracy. And initially, I supported what the United States was doing in Vietnam because I had le been led to believe that they were doing that to preserve democracy. That was the line of the United States. And I had to come to the conclusion by watching the news, and we received more news about the war in Vietnam in Canada, fortunately, than they received in the United States. And maybe the one picture that comes to my mind that maybe helped settle the question for me was of the young girl who was running, who had been bombed, and her body was on fire, and she was running. And that was the Americans who did that to her. The Americans, in the name of democracy, killed three million people in Vietnam, but we don't talk about that these days in our media. We talk as if since 1945, there's hardly been anybody killed in wars. <laughs> well, maybe not very many Americans, other than the Americans who have gone overseas and stuck their nose in other people's business. So how did society look back then, man? Was it more conservative? Was it more religious? Was it more uh, liberal? How, how did society look back then? Uh, I think that society was more, more religious, 
but um, without belief. Okay. Uh, but uh, people were more church going mm -hmm. on the whole in, in North America than, than what they are. And, and the, uh, Vietnam, the Vietnam War, was that before World War II? Please. No, the Vietnam War uh, was initially a war of France because Vietnam had been a French colony. And France, after fighting there for 10 years, they decided they could not hold that colony any longer. So then the Americans decided to go into Vietnam. You know, they were the new colonialists in, in Vietnam. So, so similarly to today, it seems that there's some sort of a colonial alliance that was at work back then, and it's still at work today. It just kind of hides in the shadow and then comes to the surface every now and then when the interest is threatened. Is that, is that, would that be a correct assessment? Yeah, so quite often now we have Great Britain, France, aligned with the United States and Canada always lines up with whatever the United States, wherever the United States goes, Canada will go to. But there have only been like a couple exceptions. Uh, I think it was under John Cretchen or Paul Martin that Canada did not go into to Iraq. And Earlier than that, under Pearson, uh, Pearson kept Canada out of directly going into Vietnam, okay. although Canada did help the United States somewhat. And I would say what, why the difference was public opinion. Mm. And that's why it's very, very important as a peace movement that we don't let our guard down. How was the peace movement back then? Uh, much stronger. Okay. Do you and think, especially do you as a young person, I can remember students from the university came and demonstrated at the high schools and handed out literature to convince those of us who were high school students. I didn't get convinced that way because I uh, was already convinced by a group of young people, and one of them is here tonight, David Gale who uh, was talking and did some things at our school so that other students uh, would be informed okay. about what was going on so can, in can, Vietnam. Can you connect that when, in terms of, you said the Vietnam was after World War II, right? Yeah. Vietnam War, okay. And then the collapse from, of this... Uh, from 55 to 65 under the French, then 65 to 75. And in 1975, on 30th of April or May the 1st, Vietnam uh, threw the Americans out. Okay, and then, and then uh, the Soviet Union was a major part of World War II, correct? Yeah. And uh, were we allies of the Soviet Union back then? Yes, in and people forget that now. Lovely. And uh, it's quite disgusting for Can Canadian parliamentarians to clap for Ukrainian Nazis in our parliament mm. because those are the same Nazis that our families, our ancestors were fighting. Mm -hmm. and, and, and many Canadians, like the Americans held back and didn't go into World War II as quickly as Canada did. But Canada was aligned with Britain and entered World War II actually earlier than the United States. Mm -hmm. And a lot of Canadians died uh, fighting Nazism. And, and what about uh, the collapse of the Soviet Union that was in the 90s? That ended up by 91. 91. So that's a big period of time there. Yeah. Do you think liberalism was such a major force worldwide before the collapse of the Soviet Union? Or, or in terms of the promotion? Because there is a, a certain misconception here. There's something called human rights. There's something called international law, etc. But often it has been mistaken 
for the liberal umbrella as an identity. And so when, when did we start seeing this, this major force of, of this liberal identity being promoted worldwide? Uh, because, because uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm saying this because uh, this is, again, connecting back to this idea of mental illness, etc. Um, I think everybody has a little bit of liberal in them, even conservative in Canada. I mean, I come from the Middle East, so you look at conservative here and it's liberal. It's liberal conservative. It's not, it's not conservative because, you, you, you know, we have such extreme example of conservative. I'm not saying that's good or that's bad. I'm just saying there is an ideology called liberalism. And it's such an open ideology, and it's kind of a good solution to create a melting pot, right? Well, I think, too, we have to face the fact that what is said and what is taught and what is done by governments can be two very different things. So very often we have people at universities who are professors who talk about conservative and liberal ideas, and everything sounds very good. And we have politicians who do the same, but their practice sometimes leaves a great uh, lot to be desired. All we have to do is look at the two main contenders for American president. Mm. I think it's, a, personally, I think it's a disgrace <laughs> that we have one man who wants to bring fascism to the United States, which is Donald Trump, and another man, Biden, who is really too old for the job, mm. and who has the wrong idea, he has an idea of expanding the U.S. empire. I think this idea, since 1945, everything changed. But I think the mentality of, le of many leaders didn't change. What changed everything was, was the dropping of the bomb on Hiroshima. In Japan. And Nagasaki. That changed everything. Because with the dropping of those bombs, it meant that the world can no longer have world war. Mm. If there is world war, it will be game over for everyone. Um, Especially today, everybody has the, back then it was only the United States who, who possessed such technology, but today many, many players are, are uh, many players have that bomb too, if not more, more destructive bombs too. So, it didn't take the Soviets very long to catch up the United States, so it wasn't very long. The U.S. and the Soviet Union both had nuclear weapons. And that meant that neither one of those two could start a fight that would um, open the door to world war. So, so okay, I want to tie back so we're not... Uh uh, dispersed in terms of ideas. So my point when it comes to liberalism is that th the idea of, again, the, the, the historical conflicts, the historical issues don't matter as much because there's this perception of an open world where everybody can just get along and we can focus on getting along as humanity, right? Um, but what happened is, I mean, COVID happened, which kind of destroyed a lot of things because the liberal identity does not have the tools to allow people to uh, persevere such harsh uh, realities that are unfolding around them. Uh, and it, it, it promotes togetherness, but what I find personally is that it promotes extreme individuality. Individuality in a sense that is needed today, which is what I want to discuss, but there was a major event that changed the narrative completely, and that is Ukraine. Because in the case of Ukraine, we started digging up things like the, the historical narratives matter. The, the people of the land and their historical struggles matter. And this is a part of our mental illness, man, because a lot of the people kind of let go of all of these issues in their lives only to find out that it's not something that's actually happening. It's just a, a promotion for political reasons, right? Because after the Ukrainian war, the narrative now expected everybody 
to be on the side of historical conflicts such as the one in Ukraine, right? And all of a sudden, empire rose to the top. And, and that's when we start seeing all these mental illness because personally what I think the main cause of it is that the human temple have collapsed. Why? Because under the liberal identity and our ideas of extreme individuality, we realize that we are truly all alone <laughs> in our ideas and, and we, we lack the ability to connect once more, right? But I also think that's a delusion, Ed, right? Because I, I want to talk about human rights as a movement. I want to talk about the peace movement and the hard work and sacrifice that, that people have put forward together to create something called human rights, locally, globally, right? Um, and, 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 and because even though that seems to have been assassinated in a way, but the truth is the idea of the international human being, human rights, international law is very much alive in everybody's hearts and minds. Uh, especially in Canada, I think if we remove the ideas of human rights and international law and our commonality in it, what remains of the Canadian identity as a common identity, right? So, so can, you, can you please tell us a little bit about how these things came into existence, human rights, international law in particular, because I think they have nothing to do with the liberal ideology in their core, right? They, they have to do a lot about people who struggle to put women's rights to the front, people who have struggled to put, uh, you know, if you want to call also LGBTQ or whoever uh, in, in that mix as well. But human rights is also about people from different religions, people from different uh, parts of the world, the idea of common existence. So, so uh, in your journey, right, you must have seen people struggling to put these things on the map, to make them a reality. And you must have seen people galvanized on the streets, uh, peace movements, pushing against war and pushing for that common human identity, right? Uh, and, and then what happened there? Because it seems that that's suffering right now in terms of the, the, the global commonality on these issues, or at least the focus has shifted, right? Well... <laughs> You bring up a lot of issues. It's like I'm not a philosopher. Sure. Okay. Uh, but my wife and I have visited over 45 countries. Okay. And we sometimes feel when we visit other countries that we have things to learn from people in other countries about human rights. Um. And uh, some countries, for example, we were in Singapore, and they have this crazy idea that everyone should have a roof over their head. <laughs> they think that's a human right. But in Canada, somehow, that isn't uh, one of our human rights mm. yet. And I think it should be. Uh, so there's different understandings of, of what should be a human right. I think too often we talk a good line about human rights, but it's just ideas, or we fight about language. And sometimes, yeah, if somebody calls my wife or my granddaughter a nasty name, and I hear it, I would do something about it to con counter it. Um, <laughs> I tell them that's not a way to, proper way to behave. So, so can we say that human rights are, are a result of an international collaboration? And was there a, what, what's with the perception that the Western powers and majorly the unipolar world with the United States in charge are the leaders of human rights in the world? Where's that discrepancy here? Uh, well, the United States is very good at whatever they do in the United States as presenting it as the best in the world. And, and they have Hollywood, and Hollywood is very, very good <laughs> and very successful at what they do. So we look at Hollywood, and we think everyone in the United States has a wonderful life. But if you drive across the border to Montana, North Dakota, it doesn't take very long to see there is immense poverty. Not very over just a little over 100 miles from here. So there's a perception problem when it comes to that. You know, I think today's world is a great example of 
all the countries that showed up for human rights and international law. Look at South Africa. Also in Europe, Spain has done a good job. Ireland is speaking up. And uh, it seems that there is, there is an opportunity on a political level for this international solidarity that is cooking. But uh, I want to... Oh, oh, just before... Sure. Sorry. If we in the West are in favor of human rights, then how come we're not in favor of human rights for the Palestinians? South Africa says very clearly that Israel is acting like an apartheid state. Mm. Well, I think South Africa knows what they're talking about. They have the experience to know what they're talking about. Israel is acting like an apartheid state. And we could use stronger descriptors for what Israel is doing. Uh, is that the, you know, Canada, get, our prime minister gets up in the House of Commons and says, we stand with Israel. Well, if you're a country that is for human rights, how can you stand for a country that is engaged in a process to kill everyone just because they belong to a certain ethnic group. Let, let alone truth and reconciliation, right? Yeah. Okay, so so uh, there's something here that I want to point to, is this, this crazy disconnect between the narrative, which was also the government's narrative about being champions of human rights and international law, which seems to now be contrasted by some sort of a Hollywood delusion, as you call it, that is really imperialist agendas worldwide. And they kind of act like a pact, right? And there's dangers to that, because if we look at Israel as an imperialist country and a colony and a co uh, settler colonial state, and we look at Canada as a settler colonial state, to kind of bunch all of these countries together into one, to me, there's a major danger there, because the history in Canada here and what people in the free and democratic world, as supposedly, are calling for something called truth and reconciliation, while over there, people are calling for more war and annihilation. So how can we tie a settler colonial state like Canada to the settler colonial state like Israel, right? Have you, have you ever seen in history this thing kind of pop up where the narrative shifts? And there is, there is the, 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 you know, the commonality and the world stage is no longer the one that's in charge, but the, also the, 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 the imperialist agenda is kind of taken over to whoever is charging that. So I can refer to being a teenager. David Gale and I were on the wrong side at a certain point. Mm. The majority of Canadians thought that people who supported the people of Vietnam were wrong, that the U.S. in its bombing of Vietnam were right. But because of the students and after the students did their demonstrations, workers started demonstrating too, and the movement for peace in Vietnam became stronger. Was there a narrative that Vietnam is your enemy and they will, if, if, if the U.S. loses in Vietnam, then they're basically going to start invading the rest of the world or etc.? Yeah, uh, yeah uh, that, that was the idea that was uh, used all the time. And when they the, called it the domino theory. And when the, that If you let one com country go communist, it will continue, continue, continue until all of Canada would be caught. <laughs> so, I mean, it was really quite wild. Okay, so, so the war ended and nothing happened? Everything was fine all of a sudden? Uh, right? Nothing happened. Lovely. Okay, so can we say that the peace movement and the galvanization in numbers did make it a real change? Yes, the peace movement made a major change. And the other thing that made a change for Americans is when so many of their boys came back, came home in caskets. Hmm. And that was a decisive thing for the, for many Americans. You know, they were all for the war as long as somebody else's sons and sons and daughters were fighting us. But when it came, and of course some people didn't fight, some, you know, came to Canada and went to Europe and got away. More the wealthier ones, whereas the black people, usually when they were sent to war, they were stuck there fighting. 
and it was most of them weren't able to escape from fighting. Interesting, because that's how that's how it seems to me as well. It seems that this this narrative for war is pushing, but it's going to be the the poorest of society that's going to be sent to be killed, not really the ones who are pushing for war. You know, there 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 is one thing that you mentioned here. This is a major factor also in the Middle East and the Middle Eastern resistance. Is that is is the factor of sending? Is it is it a necessity to send? American soldiers dead home before before the American establishment can catch up to the seriousness of the issue and maybe join in in the world force to, to put in a better world and maybe even a better world organization than the one we had is that a necessity I mean that's a question because wh whoever if they if they get continue pushing in this endless war there is no kind of sight in the horizon they're just gonna send the poor people in there right well one thing we have to realize is the fight for and against war is a political fight. Mm -hmm. And if politicians feel they will be defeated at the ballot box if they stand for war, their position can change quite quickly. And we're seeing now with the federal government, even though it's strongly committed Behind Israel and in support of the United States, they're worried that their support of Israel could lose them votes. Mm. So that's why now they're starting to dance around and some of them lined up behind the NDP motion. And they're looking, okay, how can we still do what we're doing but not lose support? And that's a start of actually taking a different position. Yeah, and I, I, I want to stop at this point here, is the importance of the civic movement being nonpartisan and not being taken into the different political factions. Because, um, I, I, I mean, we come to this idea of the individual again. It has to be an individual choice. And I think one of the dangers today is populism, because we also see religious populism on the rise, and that's no good. So I think it's a very good point to mention that to become a part of the worldwide civic peace movement uh, is to be an individual and is to study carefully and to make a choice of being a part of this and not being a part of that. Because the day also might come where this movement is going to, somebody is going to try to politicize it too and take advantage of it, right? Uh, yeah, so I just like to inject a little bit about the World Peace Council. The World Peace Council was formed in 1949. So this year, the World Peace Council and the national peace movements like the Canadian Peace Congress and our own Regina Peace Council are celebrating 75 years of our existence and our work. Uh, initially, out of World War II, there was a people around the world came to the same conclusion, and that was, we can't have another war, world war. And the United States, at a certain period, was considering us using nuclear weapons on Vietnam. And especially, there was a general called Curtis LeMay, who thought that would be the way to end the war, rather than to withdraw. Uh, fortunately, other military men did not agree with him, and the president of that time did not agree with him, or we would have seen nuclear weapons used, would, would you and say, who knows where it could have gone. Would you say the civic peace movement had a hand in stopping that from happening? Yes, definitely. Okay, so that's wonderful. So there, yeah. is, there, is, there is power in such a thing. Um, you know, and every movement always starts from somewhere, from small groups that become active, that do things publicly, and it grows. This is what happened in the war in Vietnam. In the war, this was what happened when Canada could have gone into Iraq. There were a lot of people on the streets, especially in Montreal. And the Canadian government looked at the demonstration in Montreal because French Canada traditionally has been stronger for peace than the rest of Canada. And we're seeing that today a little bit now, too. Yeah. So. And uh, 
that made a big difference. Uh, so uh, personally, I'm doing whatever I can to try and strengthen the peace movement and to see it go into a more effective movement. Okay. So I want to I wanna interject here with this point in particular. First of all, for all of those that are feeling mental illness, I just want everybody to, whether they're online or whether here in the room, to realize one thing, that certain things are bigger than ourselves. And that is not something that anybody should take on themselves. You don't own anybody's shit, period. And, and the reality is this. We did have a certain idea of an empire that emerged. And we did have a certain human temple that was liberalism and materialism. And is this an empire? If we study empires in the past, we can see that all empires, when they start losing or they go on retreat, they have some symptoms. And if we look at this one, the symptoms are one, you're gonna have wars break out on, uh, on, uh, on the outskirts of the empire. And so that could be looked at as Ukraine and in Israel. And then the other point of declining empire is that as the wars wage, we see degradation internally in the heart of empire, meaning less social services because the resources need to be diverted for war, less social services, less education, less healthcare, less of all of these things. And, and so before I kind of wrap up the, today's talk, can Canada and any of the Western world countries exist in the world as sovereign nations and prosper without being a part of empire? Or have we always been an empire, and that's the only way we can prosper? Well, Canada went from being a colony of Great Britain to having a, a colonial-type relationship with the United States. So very often, our foreign policy is not made in Ottawa. Very often, our foreign policy is made in Washington and then rubber-stamped in Ottawa. Uh, but um, if we look around the world, there are examples of countries that are a lot smaller than Canada who are speaking up. Uh, we uh, can look just 90 miles off the coast of the United States. Cuba has existed as an independent country for about 70 years. Uh, little Barbados in the Caribbean has a prime minister who leads a nation that's maybe 300,000 people, but when she speaks, you would think she's speaking for 300 million because she speaks so clearly and challenges the people who want to have wars in South America and Central America. She speaks very clearly against that, and, I, and her name is Mia Motley, and I would suggest that everyone look her up on Facebook. There's many uh, pictures of and uh, interviews with, with her on Facebook that are, are very w wonderful and show that it is possible for countries to take a sovereign role, road and not just follow along. Okay, so my suggestion to kind of wrap up the conversation before we get into some music and some social and artistic atmosphere is that uh, there's very little we can do to maybe change the political narrative from the top-down approach. The only thing we can do is to try to organize at a human level. And that's an example of what we're trying to do here. Music for Peace as a release. The whole idea of it is to connect artists worldwide to the global peace movement. Meaning is that artists can fundraise for the global peace movement, can also now be put on the map for the local peace movements, whatever they exist, that they know this artist is interested in peace. What else can they work together? And I think that's a really sound strategy because we don't have a solution today, but we can say with the fact that we've come together to at least have an initiation. And the next step is who else can we bring on board, right? Can we bring graphic designers? We have artists here. Thank you, Christian Barreno, for being with us tonight. Uh, we have musicians. We have peace activists. We have teachers. We have people from, from many backgrounds. And I think that's, that's the goal, is that once we set up that intention and realize that all it takes is choice, and truly, we do need 
the individual today. So uh, a, a shout out for everybody to continue on their self-education and to have a clear choice for themselves as individuals because these are the days of the individuals, not the days of peace, but the days of, of, of war, right? Uh, and, and Ed, uh, with your help, we'd love to continue pushing forward to uh, try to see also what we can do with the Canadian Peace Congress and maybe in different Canadian cities, uh, put people together to push the narrative for peace because the one problem in, in today's world is populism. We see in Turkey a religious populist movement is, is waging. We see in different countries also these things are happening. We see certain people like Netanyahu trying to push for the religious war narrative, which if it happens, then it ignites the war everywhere in the world. And we got to be careful of that. And I think the only antidote, antidote for that is to give people worldwide an example of that common human temple that we began today talking about. And I really... In, in my research, I don't see any other organization worldwide like the World Peace Movement that can actually do that uh, because we have enough spiritualism, we have enough philosophy that everybody can tap into, but the World Peace Movement is the only organization that's worldwide, that is independent, and that is nonpartisan. So maybe if you want to just give us the, the closing remarks on the importance of having a movement that is nonpartisan and what that means exactly, so people can feel comfortable that when they're joining such an organization, they can join as individuals and not be assimilated in, in a certain collective mindset, per se. Right? So, in 2022, my wife and I went to Vietnam to an international meeting of the World uh, Peace Movement. That's what I said there. I started wrong. <laughs> 2022. 2022. All right. Thank you, dear. <laughs> so we went to Vietnam, and there were over 100 people there representing different countries from around the world. And everybody was working on the same issues with the same concerns. And it was a very ex inspiring experience that we had. I'd just like to make a comment about Saskatchewan politics for a moment. If you go and talk to the Saskatchewan politicians of today, now I say this as an old person of 70, <laughs> they do not know their history. Mm. So we need you to study the history of the political leaders so that you can tell your representatives so that maybe then they will uh, speak about what their parties used to stand for. Tommy Douglas was the first parliamentary. He was Premier of Saskatchewan from 44 to 61. He was the first parliamentarian in the British Commonwealth to sign the Ban the Bomb Petition. But there had been a lot of petitioning and people went to him with thousands of petitions. So he said, okay, he could read the tea leaves. Uh, John Diefenbaker was no big radical, but John Diefenbaker helped open up trade with China and Russia. And Canadian farmers made billions of dollars from the sale of wheat because of that initiative. Uh, the Liberals also did some things for peace. So as a peace movement, we don't favor any one party. We try to get them all speaking for peace in a nonpartisan way. And uh, by the same token, when what is needed today is peace agreements. What, and it doesn't matter if we're talking about the fighting between Ukraine and Russia or the fighting between Israel and Palestine. We need peace agreements to be struck. So it's no good everyone getting all excited about what a terrible guy Netanyahu is. I agree with them, but so what? That's right. There, there is a need for negotiations. And it's the same thing with Putin. We don't have to like him. 
Uh, I personally don't agree with his politics, but that doesn't matter. He's the man who is the leader of their country, of Russia. And if we want, be, because the theory with the war in Russia from the West was, we will bury them economically, we will bleed Russia dry, and then we will grab their land, and we will be able to to <laughs> get it for nothing. Yeah. Okay, that was the theory from the West. Well, now it's looking like this theory might be working in reverse, because... That's the right. West is having trouble now supplying Ukraine with enough uh, bullets. Hmm. So instead of furthering and giving billions more to Ukraine, that's like just putting money down a hole, we should be seeing, okay, can we sit down and come to some agreements where the security needs of the different sides including the U.S., That's right. can be met. And, and I really believe that the civic society is the only thing that can provide such, such a movement because what we're seeing is when every collective that has segregated wealth and segregated power is uh, holding on its own, the logical outcome of that is the logical outcome of the natural world and of tribalism. They will eventually go to war unless there are some alliances that are formed. But when the politics fail apart, then that's when they go to war. And so it's very important that the civic path, and I, I really see that in the peace movement, be something that's welcoming to people from different factions. We want to win people over that are on the Ukrainian side, uh, that for Ukrainian sovereignty and etc. And I think that's the thing. If we have such a balanced approach to a civic society, then it'll start pulling individuals from all kinds of collectives and forming a new type of collectives of, of true individuals and, and true mosaic of society. Because that's the only thing that can bridge it. Otherwise, we can expect more, uh, more, more war internally and externally, right? Um, so, uh, so, yeah, Ed, thank you so much for, for being here today. And I hope that we can do more. The road is long. We're just beginning, but uh, but I think, you know, it's a start today. This music release is a start. Hopefully we can work more together and meet new people and, uh, and certainly uh, usher the independent civic society voice maybe together or at least impact it. And if I can just have a few seconds more, I think our health system in this province is in crisis. I think our education system is in crisis. And... We need to take money from a bloody military budget and put it to solve uh, problems that's that right. people face. That's right. And, and you know, and that's the thing. If, if, if you're a person who is watching this who's from Ukraine, it's very important to realize that the war ignited uh, not because of any Ukrainian-Russian purpose, but rather from an empire perspective. Uh, if you look at the war in Palestine and Israel, you better recognize that that didn't ignite for just a historical context, but rather from an empire perspective, the, the preservation or, and the fighting over uh, energy and supply routes, etc. And so our division is only going to make things worse. And the more war, the less there will be resources for health, for, for social, for for. Uh, for education, uh, etc. So this is definitely vital to our well-being in the future. And I'd like to give Noor a very big thanks because I believe it takes courage <laughs> to do what he is doing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Thanks. Thanks everyone for coming. There's going to be some great music. And uh, this is Christian Barreno. He is the most amazing artist I've ever met. You know, this is a funny story. I always ask artists to give me a very a very deep, you know, what made you start doing art? What, what's this deep connection that you have with art? And Christian was always very simple. I love colors, his answer was, you know. But truly, his, his soul is transparent as it comes. So anyways, thank you so much for coming and uh, enjoy the rest of the night.